So today we're going to be talking about COPD and asthma by looking at uh, buddy cop films uh, and also looking at, uh, at Weezer. So uh, COPD, D cop, the original buddy cop formula is you take a normal guy just trying to do his job and you add a provocateur. Uh, obviously, this is Beverly Hills Cop, where you have Eddie Murphy as a provocateur. Um, this is kind of similar to COPD, where you have the normal lungs just trying to do their job, and you have cigarette smoke messing things up. Um, although this is not the first in the genre, Beverly Hills Cop with Axel Foley as the original Detroit Cop is uh, probably the first thing that pops into everyone's mind when it comes to buddy cop action movies. Uh, the straight and narrow guy is partnered with the man who pisses him off. It's not new to the 1980s. It's as old as time. You see incarnations of this in the 1970s in Europe with films made famous by Francis Weber and Gerard Depardieu, like uh, Achelle right here. And you have even older examples from years prior with people like Abbott and Costello as well. Going back to right here of COPD, um, cigarette smoke, as you can see, causing emphysema here, um, paraceptal panlobular. So COPD is the third leading cause of death in the United States, with over 10 million people every year being afflicted. The only disease with a greater hit are heart disease and, uh, of course, jealousy. COPD includes emphysema, uh, which is characterized by the destruction of the lung alveoli, in addition to airspace enlargement. Bronchitis is another one with the chronic cough and phlegm, and of course, small airway disease, a condition in which the small bronchioles are narrowed and reduced in number. Uh, respiratory symptoms uh, and other features of COPD can occur in people who do not meet the normal definition of COPD that we'll talk about later based only on airflow obstruction by spirometry. Like I was saying earlier, cigarette smoke uh, is kind of the, the wrench in the situation, affecting both the large and small airways. And of course, small airways here are defined by airways two millimeters and under. Large airways changes, large airway changes cause cough and sputum production, where small airway changes and Alveolar changes cause the physiologic alterations that we see usually with spirometry. Uh, interestingly enough, it is possible to have severe obstructive symptoms, you know, like you would see in small airway disease, without the emphysematous destructive process in the alveoli, though, of course, this is rare. This is another good one. Same director. And of course, who's on first? So uh, when it comes to emphysema, a banana in the tailpipe is the perfect obstructive uh, analogy. You can't get things out, and Eddie Murphy dusts you in the streets of Los Angeles. So there's usually uh, kind of a, a little stepwise process that's written here. Number one, you have exposure, a chronic exposure to cigarette smoke, triggering an inflammatory response and immune cell recruitment in the large airways and the small airways and the terminal uh, air spaces of the lung in genetically susceptible individuals. Number two, inflammatory cells uh, release proteinases damaging the extracellular matrix, supporting the airways, supporting the vasculature, and supporting the gas exchanges throughout the surface of the lung. You also have the structural cell death uh, that occurs from oxidative damage, cellular senescence, and proteolytic loss of the cellular matrix attachments that leads to extensive loss of the smaller airways and, of course, alveolar destruction. And, of course, the, uh, the last big thing here has to do with the last end, which we might have seen kind of here. Uh, you have disordered repair of elastin and other extracellular matrix proteins and components uh, that contribute to airspace enlargement and emphysema. So elastin and anti-elastin. Elastin is crucial to lung integrity. Uh, there is uh, an elastin anti-elastin balance, which is shown by people with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, these people who are at increased risk of emphysema. 
It's kind of like the osteoclast, osteoblast situation in bones. Too much elastase and you get emphysema, elastin degradation, and disorder repair are thought to be, you know, the primary mechanisms uh, in the development of emphysema. But it's not just elastin and anti-elastin. You also have inflammation. Um, plays a big role, you know. Uh, to a certain extent, adult lungs should be able to uh, replace the lost smaller airways and microvasculature and repair the damaged alveoli in a normal patient, you know, in a normal person. Macrophages, you know, uptake apoptotic cells and produce growth factor that promote lung repair, but cigarettes impairs macrophage uptake of these apoptotic cells and you have limited repair. And obviously, one of the big deals, and this is probably the biggest thing here, one of the big deals uh, in emphysema is hyperinflation of the thorax. You see it, pink puffers, blue bloaters, whatever. Um, obviously, the pleura helps velcro your lungs to the chest wall. And, uh, the inflation you see in emphysema is done to preserve the maximum expiratory airflow. This is because as lung volumes increase, which they will, because of decreased elastic nature of the lungs in emphysema, the recoil pressures increase and airways enlarge so that airway resistance decreases. In theory, this sounds pretty cool, but what's easy to forget is that all this air ends up getting trapped because of the decreased elasticity of these lungs because they're being destroyed by cigarette smoke and it can't be pushed out. It's obstructive, okay? And not just because of small... Um, issues with small airways, it's also obstructive and it's also, uh, you have a decreased elasticity because of destruction of the, the alveoli and the actual makeup of the lungs. Um, and so in, in this case of hyperinflation, although you know your airways have been compensating for increased resistance, the hyperinflation ends up flattening the diaphragm. And this causes a few more issues. Uh, another step of four. Number one, uh, it decreases the distance from the top of the diaphragm to the abdomen. You can't apply the same abdominal pressure during inspiration that helps push out the rib cage and also helps with inspiration. Second, because muscle fibers of the flattened diaphragm are shorter than those of more normally curved diaphragm, their movement is restricted and you have a decreased and inspiratory pressure, yikes. Number three, a flattened diaphragm has to, I'm getting a call. It was a telemarketer. Anyway, a flattened diaphragm has to, um, has, you know, um, flattened diaphragms, uh, you need to have a creation of an increased net pressure applied to the lungs by contraction of the inspiratory muscles. So essentially what that means is that you have increased work from the non-diaphragmatic muscles of inspiration because the diaphragm isn't able to uh, do its proper job. And then the fourth thing is that the thorax is so distended by this flattened diaphragm, you, you need to have much more work by the other muscles of the chest and you literally end up tiring uh, yourself out. Um, in people with CO2 and people, sorry, with CO2, people with emphysema and people with um, COPD, you, you will see an elevation in their arterial CO2, um, but that in addition to pulmonary hypertension usually isn't seen until the fourth expiratory volume in one second is less than 25% of predicted though obviously presentations may vary. An elevation of arterial CO2 and pulmonary hypertension um, you know, can mess things up, but since the majority of patients and the majority of hypoxia and COPDs from ventilation, perfusion mismatches because of small airway obliteration, if you try correcting a ventilation, perfusion mismatch with oxygen, it doesn't work, you have to consider the other causes of hypoxemia, hypoventilation, ventilation, perfusion mismatches, shunts, diffusion impairments, and of course, low partial pressure of oxygen.
So uh, bronchitis, cigarette smoking results in mucus gland enlargement, goblet cell hyperplasia. Uh, this leads to an increase in cough and mucus production, which is the defining feature of bronchitis. Uh, you'll note this is different than the airflow limitation that we were seeing in emphysema and we will see in small airway disease. Just important to know. Uh, in response to cigarette smoking, goblet cells increase in number and extent throughout the bronchial tree and then it goes squamous metaplasia, which predisposes to cancer and also messes up mucociliary clearance. Neutrophil influx has been associated with purulent sputum, which we'll talk about later in terms of antibiotic treatment. Um, and associated with the pure and sputum uh, during respiratory tract infections. Uh, small airway disease, they become narrowed by a hyperplasia of the cells or accumulation of mucus and fibrosis. Small airways under two millimeters are the major site of uh, increased resistance. Uh, you see the replacement of surfactant secreting cells with goblet cells in what's a metaplastic process, and smooth muscle hypertrophy is also present, which increases the distal resistance by increasing the luminal narrowing that is also undergoing fibrosis, mucus production, edema, and cellular infiltration. The reduction that you have in surfactant ends up increasing the surface tension, which predisposes to airway collapse and even more resistance. A lot of the time, this precedes the alveolar destruction that is pathognomonic for emphysema. And, and as an aside, patho, pathognomonic, you have two words here, you know, pathology and mnemonic. And mnemonic is obviously like a shorthand to help you remember something. But the term pathognomonic is actually spelled like gnome, like G-N-O-M-O-N-I-C, instead of like M-N-E. So it's kind of cool, I guess, if you think that's cool. So um, in terms of COPD staging um, gold criteria, we have uh, gold stage A is typically defined as FEV1 over FEC under 0.7, but with a forced exp an FEV1 greater than 80% of predicted. Um, and this kind of stuff depends on the age and different things. But uh, in terms of the terms here, FEV1 is the forced expiratory volume in one second, but for our purposes, it's also the film entertainment value in one viewing. FVC is the forced vital capacity and also the film's visual capacity. Uh, this is gold stage A uh, because uh, this is the, the best because you have the high ratios and the number of laughs per minute. Uh, Lethal Weapon is without a doubt the best buddy cop film to date. And I would say that it actually defines the genre. We will be seeing more of Shane Black uh, later on. Uh, do not worry. All right, B, gold stage B for Beverly Hills Cop. Uh, here we have a lower FEV1 that corresponds to a decrease in the films and the lungs overall ability. Uh, the FEV1 is under 80% of expected, greater than 50% of expected. Um, it's still really good, you know, but it acts as more of a buddy cop. Sorry, it acts more of a, as a comedy than a buddy cop film. It's more comedy than cop. You know, it's still one of my favorites. Um, it's not as well written as Lethal Weapon, and it really uh, um, gets pulled through with, uh, with Eddie Murphy, who's, you know, obviously great. Uh, some of the stuff here to um, keep in mind when we look here at the, the general staging, A, B, C, D, you see a lot of beta-2 agonists kind of starting things off. And this is because you have dilation of the bronchial passages. You know, labas are real good. Um, but they reduce exacerbations overall less than um, long-acting methicoline antagonists, which is why you'll end up seeing these long-acting methicoline antagonists eventually become more first-line as kind of like the building blocks when it comes to COPD, but you'll see it as being different uh, in asthma later on. Uh, C, gold stage C for the nice guys. Uh, here again, there's a lower FEV1 that corresponds with a decrease in the films and the lungs overall. 
ability, you can say. Uh, the Nice Guys is another Shane Black classic, uh, where Lethal Weapon on one hand benefits from the last 30 minutes where it's all a fight scene and a shootout because it's solid action and there's a bunch of cool stuff. Uh, it also suffers because the buddy copness of it ends up falling a little bit. The Nice Guys is all buddy, some cop. So in that sense, it's C for buddy, you know, cop. It's not enough cop. Um, but it's still very clever, like everything else Shane Black uh, does. And here we have a gold stage D, pretty severe uh, ratios here. Uh, you have a lower film entertainment value with a decrease in the film and the lungs again, overall ability. It's lower than you would expect, surprisingly, because there's Eddie Murphy in it. Uh, and this, uh, this movie here, 48 Hours, um, essentially creates the genre in the United States. You know, um, it's not like anything lower and you'd be watching Cop Out. Um, but, you know, it's, with everything that's going for it, it's not as good as you'd think it'd be. That being said, it's still, you know, it's still worth mentioning. Um, so in terms of uh, things you can generally do, um, patients with COPD, obviously, should receive the influenza vaccine annually. Some options that you've got include things like pulmonary rehab and lung volume reduction surgery. Pulmonary rehab is really just good for decreasing hospitalization rates, quality of life, um, and lung volume reduction surgery. You can only really see in certain types of emphysema, um, specifically upper lobe predominant emphysema. So all that talk is really just to talk about preventative things that you can do. Obviously, you know, don't smoke, number one, but that's easier said than done because it looks so cool and it smells so good. We have pharmacological options here. There's really three interventions that we can do in terms of uh, improving overall survival and it's smoking sensation, oxygen, and then lung volume reduction surgery in appropriate people. Uh, so we'll start with bronchodilators. They dilate the bronchi to the bronchioles. Um, which are the small airways leading to the alveoli. Uh, and it has a cool effect on the FVC, but not as much on the FEV1. And for that, we have anticholinergic muscarinic antagonists, short-acting hypertropian bromide shows an acute improvement in the FEV1 with FVC as well, thought to be due to the decrease in the mucus production that uh, only clears the airways, but allows it to retain a relative elasticity. Um, Lamas kind of work the same way, but obviously um, are longer acting. And like I was saying, uh, beta-2 agonists. Beta-2 agonists cause dilation of the bronchial passages. They're good, but they reduce exacerbations less than Lamas, which is why Lamas, as I was saying before, um, are typically first uh, line. Here we go, more pharmacological options. Inhaled corticosteroids, the main purpose here is to reduce exacerbation. It's the, the mark of the beast in terms of the end is near. You gotta consider it in folks with two or more exacerbations a year and, and the lucky few who might have asthma symptoms as well. Uh, oral glucocorticoids, uh, chronic use is unfavorable because of the benefit to risk ratio. You really only consider it if there is nothing else to do. Theophylline is a phosphodiesterase inhibitor and offers modest airflow improvement in FVC. And when you use it, you have to constantly monitor the blood levels. It does relax the diaphragm, which I guess can be okay, unless it's already completely uh, sprawled out. And then other phosphodiesterase inhibitors, the phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitors like reflumilast, uh, have been demonstrated to reduce the exacerbations in people with severe COPD chronic bronchitis, and a bunch of exacerbations in the past. Uh, the effect on airflow obstruction and the symptoms are kind of modest. You have azithromycin as an antibiotic with cool anti-inflammatory properties, which has been shown to decrease exacerbation frequencies. And uh, oxygen, obviously, here decreases mortality if the saturation is under 88 or under 89% with 
pre-existing pulmonary hypertension or right heart failure, which you would only see in like kind of severe FEV1 um, under 25% of the predicted, the presentations vary as we were talking about earlier in the presentation. Non-pharmacological options. It's a pretty cool shot here from Lethal Weapon. Patients with COPD, like I was saying, you should get annual influenza vaccines, do things like pulmonary rehab, you do exercise, counseling, it ends up improving the quality of life and decreasing hospitalization rates, which can sound kind of like, a, um, you know, business talk where, oh, decrease hospitalization rates, but it does matter. Like having to go to the hospital sucks, all right? <clears throat> and another non-pharmacological option we were talking about was lung volume reduction, specifically in bolus emphysema and upper lobe predominant who have low post-rehab capacity. They're going to benefit from this. I saw someone with this who had severe bolus emphysema, who had lung volume reduction surgery, but then got COVID, and it did not end well. So, so here's the uh, here's the big thing here for the the next thing. Antibiotics. So let's kind of just click through these suckers. So this is the uh, these are the gold folks. This is the international collection of the best lung doctors in the world. So these guys here are kind of are kind of hesitant to throw on antibiotics. You kind of see here it remains controversial. You know, um, they tend to do it if you have um, obvious sputum purulence. You know, you, you have the, the three criteria, whatever they're called, where you have dyspnea, purulence, uh, and increased production. If you have all those things, then they're more likely to do it, specifically with sputum purulence, because here there's some sort of causative relationship. But up to date is saying give everyone antibiotics. So that's kind of interesting. Obviously, if you can use things like procalcitonin, that can be helpful in telling you if you've got a bacterial infection. Using CRP isn't as good, um, but uh, I know personally I'm more wary to just throw on antibiotics to patients in the hospital. Uh, but we'll look at the, the up-to-date thing here. And it's essentially telling you um, in hospitalized patients, you're essentially gonna give them antibiotics you know, you got to look at if you have um, predisposition to pseudomonal infections. You know, yes, no, yes, cefepime, no, fluoroquinolone or third generation cephalosporin. And in the outpatient setting, you know, you can, you know, not do it if they don't have poor outcomes. You can just choose to give them macrolides. Um, I don't particularly like this as much. I like the idea of the best lung doctors in the world saying, hey, yeah, we're going to limit antibiotics a bit, unless, you know, clearly they're just extraordinarily, you know, purulent with what they've got going on. And this is just more of that. So here's a cool question. Uh, you got a 55-year-old gentleman or person who ends up coming in here with uh, FEV, FEC, FEV1, FEC under 70%, and uh, under 70, and FEV1 under 30% of predicted. He has end-stage renal disease. A uh, status post cavity, extensive stage small cell lung cancer, and has a pretty bad ECOG performance scale and uh, performance score, and is on five liters of nasal cannula at all time. Further management of this patient's symptoms should focus on extensive chemotherapy, palliation with hospice, lung transplant, immediate intubation. Um, the answer is hospice. He doesn't have to be intubated right now. Lung transplants not going to really do anything for his extensive stage small cell lung cancer and uh, aggressive chemotherapy probably would not be able to tolerate it. So that's that. Alrighty, Weezer. Asthma is an airflow obstruction syndrome with several triggers. It's found in about 300 million people worldwide and a suspicious amount of Tour de France athletes who want excuses to carry unchecked inhalers. Narrowing of the airways is usually reversible, but in some patients with chronic asthma, there may be an element of irreversible airflow obstruction. Asthma is a heterogeneous disease with several phenotypes and manifestations, but without always the nice correspondence of specific pathogenic mechanisms. Most patients with asthma tend to be in affluent countries, though they're not always, not always, but they tend to be there with marked atopy or atopy or atopy. 
which is an exaggerated IgE allergic response to things that shouldn't cause a crazy Th1 response. The most implicated thing is the house dust mite, and then of course, other animal fur and pollen and stuff. Like I was saying, it does tend to occur in healthier places, wealthier places where there is a shift um, to Th2 response. And of course, this TH2 response is extracellular things like helminths with interleukin 4 and 5 responses rather than TH1 intracellular bacteria and viral um, responses. Um, and similar to how you have uh, uh, Weezer and wheezing and asthma being more common in wealthy and affluent societies, Weezer is the favorite band of the wealthy elite, like Bill Gates. So you may be surprised, but there are a lot of weird things that can trigger asthma. Exercise is common, particularly in children. Obviously, this is obstructive. Uh, the, the mechanism relates to hyperventilation and its effect on the increasing osmolality of the airway lining fluid, resulting in mast cell release and bronchoconstriction. Exercise-induced asthma is obviously worse in cold, dry climates than in hot, humid ones because of the relative difference in the osmolality of the fluid lining the airway and the air that's breathed in. That's why you see it in sports like cross-country, cycling, as I was saying, um, ice hockey, rather than in swimming. Now, this can be prevented with administration of beta-2 agonists, antileukotrienes and stuff, but best treated with inhaled corticosteroids. Uh, which end up reducing the population uh, of surface mast cells required for this response. Kind of interesting. It is an obstructive process. Um, atopy is the major risk factor for asthma, and non-atopic individuals have a pretty low risk of developing asthma. Uh, patients with asthma commonly suffer from other atopic diseases, like allergic rhinitis, which you typically find in over 80% of asthmatics, in addition to eczema. A minority of asthmatic patients will have negative skin tests to common uh, inhaled allergens and uh, a normal concentration of IgE. These patients with non-atopic or intrinsic asthma usually have a later onset of disease, kind of interesting, have these concomitant nasal polyps and tend to be aspirin sensitive. They usually do tend to have more severe persistent asthma. I'm gonna have a water break real quick. Very nice. So the pathology, the area of mucosa ends up getting infiltrated with activated eosinophils and T lymphocytes, and you have this activation of mucosal mast cells. Uh, it leads to inflammation that responds well to inhaled corticosteroids that we were talking about. You also see structural changes in the airways, like thickening of the basement membrane because of subepithelial collagen deposits. I think it's three and five, I'll have to double check. And um, which is thought to be the result of uh, eosinophils since they also like to release fibrogenic mediators. The pathology of asthma is remarkably uniform for the different phenotypes of asthma, including atopic and non-atopic, occupational, aspirin sensitive and pediatric or you know small kid asthma um, the pathologic changes are found in the small airways but not in the parenchyma of the lung so yeah mast cells are important in initiating bronchoconstriction uh, activation of mucosal mast cells you find it in the airway surface in asthmatic patients and also in the Airway smooth muscle layer, whereas this is not seen in normal subjects. Mast cells are activated by allergens through an IgE-dependent mechanism, and binding of specific IgE to mast cells renders them more sensitive to activation by physical stimuli like this osmolality. If you guys remember the, the, the image in your like step one books, you essentially just kind of snap and it causes degranulation. Um, lymphocytes play a pretty important role, T lymphocytes specifically, it has to do with coordinating the inflammatory process. You have a release of specific patterns of cytokines that result in the recruitment of eosinophils and 
of the survival of these eosinophils and the maintenance of mast cell populations in the airways that corticosteroids tend to suppress, which is why it's, you, you will see later on more and more, it's, it's not just second line, it's, it's essentially first line. And, and damn it, I'm just going to say it's first line. Uh, in general, the immune response system, you know, you end up releasing T2 helper cells more than Th1 uh, in a normal person, but it's super skewed in asthmatics uh, since normal airways, uh, you know, Th1 cells do predominate. Th2, these, T, these T2 helper cells release interleukin-5 that stimulate the eosinophils, um, and are associated with eosinic inflammation. And through the release of interleukin-4, you have an increase in IgE that you know is also associated with mast cell degranulation, uh, which also triggers you know all of the fluid and edema and all that stuff in the lungs that uh, we've talked about and will continue to talk about. So eosinophilic infiltration is a characteristic feature of airways and asthmatics, these cells, eosinophils, are linked to the development of hypersensitivity reactions uh, by the release of basic proteins and oxygen-derived free radicals. You get all this inflammation going on. The effects of inflammation, well, you know, the chronic inflammatory response, you know, has several effects on the target cells of the airways. You know, these things lead to the changes associated with asthma and inflammation. All right. Constant destruction. This is where you start seeing things like asthma, though reversible. Really, that's kind of one of the hallmarks of it compared to COPD. Enough inflammation, you get scarring, and you have a decrease in the reversibility of it. Um, the constant inflammation in asthma leads to epithelial disruption that has the airways lose their barrier function and the loss of penetration of allergens. There was an additional loss of enzymes that degrade certain inflammatory mediators like bradykinin. Fibrosis in all asthmatic patients, you end up seeing this. The basement membrane is thickened with subepithelial fibrosis from collagen deposition. Again, I think it's three and five. I don't have this written down. That's what I think. Um, and it's associated with eosinophilic infiltration through the release of pro-fibrotic mediators like TGF-beta transforming growth factor beta. Um, so talking more about some of the cool stuff going on with asthma, you have airway smooth muscle. It's getting all messed up. The abnormalities of airway smooth muscle are always secondary to chronic inflammatory process. In asthmatic airways, there is also the hypertrophy and hyperplasia of airway smooth muscle from the growth factors that we were talking about before, TGF-beta, but also platelet-derived growth factors, or growth factor. Airway smooth muscle cells from asthmatic patients release a bunch of inflammatory cytokines. I don't have to keep harping on this. Um, because of this inflammation, you have an increase in airway mucosal blood flow, resulting in angiogenesis from VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor, and you also have microvascular leakage from these inflammatory mediators leading to airway edema and plasma exudation into the airway lumen. It kind of just fills everything up and makes things uh, rather rough. Mucus hypersecretion is another issue. You have an increase in uh, the mucus secretion, the contributing to the viscous mucus plug, including the airways of asthmatics. This is the... Um, this can be particularly fatal in asthma. And we'll talk about specific treatments. You have hyperplasia of submucosal glands confined to large airways. And you also have hyperplasia and an increased number of epithelial goblet cells. Interleukin-13 is thought to be responsible um, for this. So uh, limitation of airflow is really the, the big thing here. It's from bronchoconstriction. You also have airway edema. You also have um, uh, luminal occlusion with fibrosis or whatever. But what you have is a decreased FEV1 to FVC and a decreased peak expiratory flow with an increase in airway resistance. Kind of similar, but kind of different to COPD. Uh, you'll see 
closure of peripheral airways in the lungs that leads to hyperinflation and air trapping. Kind of like you see in emphysema, and you also have an increased residual volume, especially during acute exacerbations and severe persistent asthma. So to diagnose it, you really, I mean, you can, a lot of the times you can just do it based on like the history and physical and if someone's wheezing, you got exposures, right? But there are some stuff you have to do, okay? So spirometry confirms airflow limitation with a decreased FEV1 to FEC ratio and decreased piece expiratory flow. You need to have reversibility greater than 12% or a two, or and a 200 milliliter increase in the forced expiratory volume in one second, 15 minutes after uh, a SABA. You can also do a methicolon challenge test where you give people uh, methicolon or, or histamines and it decreases the FEB1 by 20%. Kind of, kind of rare in terms of its usefulness. Might be useful if you're differentiating some sort of weird chronic cough or something where there's an adult and you might have normary, normal pulmonary function tests. Um, so here we're going to talk about the uh, ways to treat asthma, how you treat it, why you treat it that way, um, and then the different sort of mechanisms and the different standards of treating. You've got the GINA system, you have uh, what Up to Date says, you have what Harrison says. The whole point of this should be just kind of a just kind of like a, a understanding of everything. Uh, up to date has the stuff that you see right here on the screen. It's kind of a pain in the ass uh, because um, it, it, you know, oh, under two times a week, uh, nighttime awakenings per month, daytime symptoms, oh, two to seven, but then three to four per month. Like there's no real way to, to do a good job memorizing this. So I'll talk about uh, what I think is a better way, which is the GINA system, and then the treatments, and then how you treat and why. So you have bronchodilators, and we were talking about previously. These things act on airway smooth muscle, reverse bronchoconstriction, and asthma. Doesn't stop inflammation, does give rapid relief. Anticholinergics, um, you know, they're less effective than beta-2 agonists. Um, don't really use it. Theophylline, you can cause bronchodilation, but you have all those other side effects we were talking about. You gotta constantly monitor it to be within the therapeutic index. You have inhaled corticosteroids. These are by far the most effective controllers for asthma, and their early use has revolutionized asthma therapy. You also have systemic corticosteroids that can be used kind of as a salvage last resort. We'll talk about that. You also have anti-leukotrienes that can be used kind of in like step four, step fives in terms of treating things. They're less effective than inhaled corticosteroids. They have less of an effect on airway inflammation, but they are useful as add-on therapy if people cannot control or cannot handle low doses of inhaled corticosteroids for whatever reason. Um, you have the chromalin sodiums, the netochromils. These things inhibit mast cell degranulation. And they're effective because they end up blocking mast cells, but they're a pain in the butt because you got to take them three, four times a day, so no one uses them. Uh, steroid sparing therapies. Uh, you have immunomodulatory things, very high side effects for the benefits. Amalizumab blocks IgE, pretty expensive. Mepolizumab is interleukin 5 antibody, good for eosinophilic asthma. Um, you know, then we'll talk real quick at the end about acute asthma exacerbations. So this is the Harrison's kind of um, way of going about things. You'll see that you do have kind of a stepwise approach and in the GINA model, which is kind of like the gold model, uh, where you have a, um, a global outcome collaboration for how to treat asthma. Uh, I think also talks about steps but is different than the one that you see here in Harrison's. But the concept of step-up therapy is pretty important in the sense that you keep what you previously had. Um, 
here in mild intermittent, they're saying you do SEVAs, and then afterwards you start adding the inhaled corticosteroids. Um, this is essentially the GINA model. And to kind of go back real quick, you'll see how, how nice the uh, impetus and then the treatments are. You know, instead of having things in terms of broken up into days, under two days per week, two to seven days per week, nighttime awakening, three to four nights a month, you know, interference with activity, like all this stuff you can't keep track of. This is super nice. You know, you got first step, you, you got an issue a couple times a week. You'll notice you start here with an inhaled corticosteroid or short acting beta agonist. The biggest difference here between this and what you see in Harrison's from 2018 really reflects the change in asthma management where inhaled corticosteroids are first line. They're first line. All right. You know, and uh, what's going on here is uh, inhaled corticosteroids plus a fast acting labor. And, and in terms of what you would do for your patient, you know, it really depends on which one's more expensive, I'd say, and which one they have more access to. Um, and someone who's really requiring something once a week um, or less, you, you know, I, I would, I'd rather just, just do, um, um, just have this thing right here handy, meaning you have the ICS and the fast acting labor combination handy rather than an inhaled corticosteroid with like SEVA as needed. If you have it more than two times a week, here you have maintenance inhaled corticosteroids with as needed SEVA. So this is more as like a PRN, and this, once you step up to, you know, mild persistent asthma, at that point is where you start just having it as a baseline. The next step up is you have in most days, maybe one night a month, and he's here, you're on the maintenance of the inhaled corticosteroid in addition to the long-acting beta agonists. If you start having activity limitation, this is really the next step up where you start having severe persistent asthma. Um, in this case, you go to medium dose ICS in Aleva. Here's where you can also start acting, start adding the leukotriene antagonists. And obviously for you know max dose. You can consider, you know, high dose inhaled corticosteroids and labas with as needed oral corticosteroids. But again, you want to limit oral, oral corticosteroids just because of the effect that they have systemically. Um, and you're really just trying to target the lungs more than anything else. Um, in terms of how to treat acute severe asthma, um, you got to give them a high concentration of oxygen. Got to reach a target saturation greater than 90%. You can give them sabas via nebulizer. Um, if you think someone is going to go into respiratory failure, besides obvious intubation, um, you can do IV beta agonists uh, with nebulized anticholinergics. Magnesium sulfate can be effective when it's added to inhaled beta agonists. And like I was saying, um, if you think someone's going to go into respiratory, you know, someone's in severe respiratory distress, they're not ventilating appropriately, you start seeing a normal PCO2 or a rising PCO2, at that point, you should start considering intubation. Um, obviously, don't give sedatives. Don't use antibiotics unless you think there's some sort of pneumonia. That's really it for that. And uh, another cool question, you've got a 35-year-old man, mild intermittent asthma, he's using his inhaler more frequently. A reasonable addition to his SABA, if he's not already on it, should be an inhaled corticosteroid. This is kind of a question um, where they should already be on that. Uh, you should be on inhaled corticosteroid therapy. There's no doubt. And that's it. Thanks for your time.